We'll continue our Sunday morning series on abiding in Christ. John chapter 15, the first Sunday, we looked at abiding in his presence. And what a supreme presence we have to go into, into the very presence of Jesus. And he invites us and there's a consolation there uh, in his love. We saw last week we must abide in his purpose. And the purpose of Jesus and, and, and abiding in Jesus is so that we can bear fruit. If you missed last week's sermon or, or the week before, it's there on our website and YouTube page as well. I invite you to be caught up through that. Uh, the very purpose that we have to abide in Christ, to bear fruit, to, to glorify Christ and, and, and to exalt him as preeminent. This morning, we're going to look at something that may be a little bit more, more difficult. We're going to look at abiding in his purging. Abiding in his purging. On May the 8th in 1984, a missionary, Benjamin Weir, was a veteran missionary in Lebanon. And he was kidnapped at gunpoint by the Shiite Muslims in Beirut for 16 months. He was imprisoned, constantly threatened with death. And he recalls the very first night in captivity when one of his abductors commanded him to face the wall, said, take your blindfold off, put this on. He was handed some ski goggles with the eye holes covered in thick black tape. And all light was completely obliterated. In his mind, the sun had set. And he, he wrote, in the twilight there came to my mind the hymn, Abide With Me. I felt vulnerable, helpless, lonely. I felt tears in my eyes. And then I remember the promise of Jesus. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. It shall be done unto you. And so I prayed, Lord, I remember your promise. I think it applies to me too. I've done nothing to deserve it but I receive it as a free gift. I need you. I need your assurance, your guidance to be faithful to you in this situation. Teach me what I need to learn. Deliver me from this place and this captivity if it's your will. If it's not, help me to accept whatever's involved. Show me your gifts. Enable me to recognize them as coming from you. Praise be to you. That was his prayer. And for the next 16 months, he found his hope and joy in the fact that he wasn't simply, hear this, he wasn't simply abiding in captivity. He was abiding in Christ. And because of that, he was able to bear much fruit. The words, the hymn that he says, abide with me, are this, abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless soul abide with me. As a Christian, if we're going to bear much fruit, we must be willing to accept the master's purging. No one ever wants purging, but everyone wants fruit. And purging is a necessary part of the fruit bearing process. Perhaps all of you here this morning have a favorite fruit. I don't know if I have a, if I had to pick a favorite. I guess it would be an apple, but a grape is right up there behind it. Uh, we had some pineapple over there this morning. All of that was wonderful. How many of you strawberry fans? Uh, yeah, made a grapefruit, all these melon, all fruit. Uh, yeah, okay. We've all got a favorite fruit, and you probably know where to find that fruit. You walk into the store, you go to the produce section, you pick it up, you pay for it, you take it home and you eat it. But fruit doesn't just magically appear at the local grocery store or at the fruit stand on the side of the road. There's a process involved. Planting, watering, cultivating, growing, harvesting, transporting. And so it is with the Christian life as well. Fruit doesn't just appear in the life of a Christian, it's grown through a process. We're going to get to our passage here in John 15 in just a moment. We're just kind of laying the foundation, some groundwork here. But according to the words of Jesus himself, if we're going to bear spiritual fruit, we have to endure the rigors of growth. 
Viewing every obstacle as an opportunity to reach the full potential as a Christian. The Bible tells us that first we have to receive the life-giving water of the word of God. It would be foolish for someone to think that a tree could live without water. So also it is foolish for a Christian to think we can live without the word of life. Without the river of living water flowing from God's word. Psalm 1, 3 says he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaf uh, bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I believe you ought to be planted in God's word. I believe you ought to be planted in God's house where the water of the word of God runs freely, spending time with God corporately, spending time with God individually to satisfy that need of the water of life. But you also have to have some type of spiritual receptivity. You've got to be able to receive that with a submissive heart. In the parable of the, the seed and the sower, uh, the Bible says, He that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also uh, beareth fruit and bringeth forth a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. Jesus said, those who receive God's word on good ground, it's like a withered flower receiving a cool rain on a summer day. Mine's receptive. Hearts open. Like a farmer, many of you perhaps have plowed and tilled your land. What are you doing? You're preparing it for the seed. You're preparing it for growth. And our hearts also must be prepared, choosing to be tender to God's word. Let's look at it this morning in John 15, verse number one. The Bible says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. What's a husbandman? That's the vine dresser. The one who makes it all work. Verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Who? The husbandman. The father. And every branch that beareth fruit, he what? Purgeth it. Did you see, and, and, and we're not really even getting into this part yet, but did you see he's not purging the fruitless branch? He's purging a branch that's bearing fruit so that it can bring forth more fruit. Verse three, now ye are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. At the beginning of the chapter, we talked about bringing forth fruit. And then it said bringing forth more fruit. And now it's saying bringing forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire. And they're burned. Of all the plants God could have chosen to illustrate this truth, he chooses the vine. The branch. If you've ever had a time observing perhaps uh, grape vines, you'll notice something about the branches. They're prone to wander. They don't stick close to the vine very long. Uh, the branches like to run, spread out. They have a mind of their own, full of freedom, go where they want to go, do what they want to do, sometimes anchor into wasteful soil. Sometimes they run into areas where they should not be. And a husbandman must come and prune the branches. And what a wonderful illustration that is for our lives as well. I don't know about you, but I'm prone to wonder. As the song says, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the, the God I love. Wanting to do our own will. What we want. When we want. But if you're a child of God this morning, the Heavenly Father is our loving husbandman. Vine dresser. And his gentle hands will prune and purge areas of our lives that have gone astray. His loving touch wants to draw us back to the true vine. Keep us anchored in Christ and bearing good fruit. And so this morning as we look at abiding in his purging, mm -hmm. we're going to see three reasons why we should be patient. Abiding in Christ during the difficult times. 
We spent a while laying the groundwork. As we jump into the message, let's bow now and ask the Lord to help us. I encourage you to pray as I pray aloud as well. Heavenly Father, as we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, as you draw out these truths in our hearts, help us. The devil wants nothing to do with it. Doesn't want us to pay attention. Wants our minds and hearts focused on something else. But may we be attentive to your word only. We love you. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'd like to say, first of all, that purging signifies the providence of God. It signifies the providence of God. And here's what I mean by that. It reminds us of God's divine intervention. He has gone before us with his will. As I was studying for our, our message uh, for this evening, as I was studying that, the Lord brought to my attention some things. And one thing is that, did you know God had a plan for your life before he even created you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't get over this yesterday. God did not create you and then think, hmm, wonder what I want him to do. I wonder if I can work some situations out to kind of show him that. That's not how it happened. Before we were formed in the belly, God says he ordained us. God says in, in Acts 13, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. I've already given them something to do. I've already had a plan for their life. Watch this. He already has a plan for your life. And then he creates you just like you are so that you can best fulfill that plan. Amen. I get excited when I consider that. That means I, I don't have to wonder as I go forward for Christ. Is this possible? Well, it's not about my power. God created me to do that. Amen. God created me to follow his plan. Now I've just got to trust him. Me saying no is not a matter of questioning my ability. Now I'm questioning God's sovereignty. God is the husband and he has a plan for our lives. He's in control. The vine dresser. And if a Christian's going to bear fruit, there will be purging orchestrated by the heavenly father from time to time process of pruning mm -hmm. and by the way that's not always pleasant and you know what i've come to find out as well it's usually not at the time we want it either mm -hmm. but there's got to be trimming shaping chastising by a loving heavenly father if we're going to experience abundant fruit of an abiding relationship there was one man uh, completely dejected by all that life had thrown at him and he was walking one day in the botanical gardens there at Oxford. And a fine pomegranate tree caught his eye. As he got closer to it, one stem had been cut deeply with a pruning knife. And, and there was a gardener there. And he asked the gardener, what, what's the purpose of this? And as he got the answer, it shed new light on his troubled soul. The gardener said, sir, this tree used to shoot up and out so strongly that it bore nothing but leaves. Wow. Therefore, I was obligated to cut it in this manner. And when it was almost cut through, then it began to bear plenty of fruit. What was the gardener doing? Gardener. Trying to get it to bear fruit. It wasn't serving a purpose that it, that it was there for it. And as, as he began to cut it, a little cut wasn't enough. And as he began to almost get all the way through, it got to a point where it began to then bear fruit. God is our husbandman. He has all authority, authority over the branches. Just as a parent knows what's best for their child, God knows what's best for us, and he loves us too much to let us stray into danger. When we become prone to wonder, when we run from his will, he brings us back to the safety and abiding relationship with Christ. And sometimes it's through difficult means. A child who plays in the middle of the street is obviously acting against his father's will. And because the father wants to protect his son and knows what's best, he'll go to him and bring him back in the house and reprove him through loving discipline. And the same is true for our heavenly father. Yeah. Hebrews 12 tells us, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And the scourge of every son of me receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. 
For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? The Bible goes on to say if you're not receiving chastisement, it's because you're not his son. Hmm. He's not going to chastise those who are not his children. And as a child of God, if we continually resist the Holy Spirit, repeatedly saying no to God, refusing to yield to his own will, we're forcing God to purge our lives. And he can even take a branch away from the vine if he chooses. We read that. If a person resists the Holy Spirit and bears no fruit, he's missing the very purpose for his existence. God desires us to bear fruit. We looked at that last week. That's our purpose, to glorify him. And yet what's amazing to me is what we read in, in verse 2, that those who are most likely to endure God's pruning oftentimes are those who are already bearing fruit. It's easy to assume someone living for himself needs pruning. But here the Bible is referring to someone who's already bearing fruit. Christians faithfully going to church, trying to serve the Lord with their lives, giving, growing, and yet even faithful, godly Christians need God's purging. It may not be chastisement, but it is God's way of shaping and molding us to his will. He prunes a fruitful branch. And it's an indication when he's pruning that he sees the fruit we're producing and he wants to increase our fruitfulness. A vine dresser, as I mentioned before, spends very little time with a fruitless branch. But he'll be careful to prune and to purge and to shape a branch that's already bearing fruit. You may be doing your best to live for the Lord as best you know how. But you still come under this type of pruning. I encourage you when you face hardships, remember God only prunes and purges for your profit, for your betterment, for your productivity, so that you can bear more fruit. Instead of turning an, an angry, turning an anger and, and maybe an angry fist to God and, and wanting to get bitter and question all of this, may we instead abide in him and thank him for seeing the potential of bearing more fruit. Robert Browning Hamilton said it this way when he wrote, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow. A narrow word, said she, but all oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Never do we see more clearly than through eyes washed with tears. And when we abide during times of purging, we're, we may be saying, God, I, I don't feel, I don't like the way this feels. I don't like the trials I'm having right now, but I must acknowledge that you are God. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to let you do what you need to do in my life. You're the husbandman. You're in control of my life. I surrender it to you. Purging signifies the providence of God. But second of all, purging increases the productivity of God's people. Verse number two, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. As we understand pruning and, and purging, we can learn a lesson that God oftentimes purges by removing an object of affection. In fact, if you look at Webster's Dictionary uh, and, and see how he defines purging, it's this way, to make free of impurities, to rid of unfriendly elements. Mm. Our Heavenly Father is concerned, hear me, about anything in your life and my life that is unfriendly to him, to our fruitfulness as Christians. And so watch this. If there's pride, he wants to purge it. If there's hurt, he wants to heal it. If there's burdens, he wants to bear it. He desires 
for you to bear fruit. And even in purging, he's preparing us for greater blessings. If we're serious about bearing fruit, if we're serious about abiding in Christ and abiding in his purpose and, and bearing fruit and, and telling others, if we're serious about that, then he needs to purge anything that's drawing our affection from him. And you know what? Sometimes it's things that aren't even wrong. That he's going to purge. Hold on. Where's my attention? Hold on. You're giving a whole lot to this over there. Am I preeminent? Hold on. You've got so you can bear so much more fruit if this were removed. No, but I want this. I like this. Hold on. Who's in control? Who's sovereign? Anything that's between our soul and the Savior, he wants to purge so that we can bear more fruit. You say, but if he takes this out of my life, he's just, he doesn't love me. And I get so upset about this. And how can this happen? And if he's a loving God, why would this happen? Well, it's because he's a loving God. It's because he sees the fruit that you could bear in your life. And he says, remove that. Let me remove this. I want your attention on me. Let me take this out of your life and see where you turn now. Let me take this that's, that's occupying your time and attention and get your eyes back towards me. He's now able to produce fruit more freely. He purges by removing and he purges by keeping us disciplined to the vine. Branches, if you've seen the vineyard, they need to be held tight, tautly to the, to the vine. And he intends for us to remain attached to him, especially during times of trials and afflictions. Some of the most fruitful Christians I dare say that you can think of are those who stay faithful through the most difficult trials in life. What are they doing? They're abiding in Christ. They're clinging to the vine, their source of life. They grow stronger and now producing greater fruit. And yet the opposite is also true. The Christian who turns his back on God during times of purging. And sometimes we look and think, well, I can understand that. And yet God is the husband that wants us to produce more fruit. And, and if we turn our back, that's the Christian who has another trial awaiting. Another lesson to be learned. Sometimes God will use things in our life to get our attention to turn back towards him. Paul said this in Romans 5, and not only so, but we glory. Here's what he said. We glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worked with patience and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. If we stay faithful during those times of tribulation, and though we may not understand, we're trusting God as our source of life and the vine, and, and we're clinging closer to Him, and, and He gets us through. And we see the hope that we have in Him, and we see that even though life seems impossible, God got us through. We have that experience. We have that hope. We have that trust, and now something else comes our way. We know, hey, we're just looking to God for this. I wouldn't say this was a tribulation or a trial, but our church has experienced that. I think about this time almost two years ago where we need this, and, and God, would you provide this, and how in the world is this going to happen? And here it is. And in the next week, oh, wonderful, we passed that, but now we've got this. And God meets that need. And I never forget some of you and some of the things you've said. I said, bring another need to you and you say, well, that's okay. God's already done this and this. He's going to do this too. Oh, yeah. What is that? We've seen him come through and we're going to trust him. But the same is true in our purging. Amen. If we stay faithful to him. Are you able to praise God in tribulations? Paul realized what he was going through, the difficult times. God was placing patience, hope. Within him. I don't know about you. But as I. 
got a little bit older, became a teenager, well, then went to, to Bible college, then graduated from Bible college. I tell you what, I was ready to conquer the world. I mean, I knew a thing or two. Yeah, exactly. That is, is my thought as well. And as I look back, now almost 15 years in, in full-time ministry for God, he's still molding me, shaping me. Seeing things in, in my life. I, no, no, I don't want it that way. No, no, let me let me remove this. No, that, that rough on those edges. Let's prune a little bit. Oh, this, this is not going to feel good. Oh, I'm going to bring this into your life, but hold on. Stay close to me. I've got something for you. I, I've got a plan for your life. The same is true for you. That's why Paul could later spring to his feet and say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. God was teaching him through burdens come blessings. Amen. Do you desire to bear greater fruit for Christ? Do you desire to be more productive? Are you willing to endure the present purging to fulfill a greater purpose? Let God's strength flow through your heart. Abide with him. He'll give you hope. The purging you face now will only yield a greater reward. Purging signifies the providence of God. Purging increases the productivity of God's people. And last of all this morning, purging facilitates the purification of God's people. Notice verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you here in this passage, as in chapters 14, now 15, 16, 17, he's speaking to his disciples. He, he's, they, they've left the upper room. They're heading to the garden. Well, he'll pray where he's about to be betrayed and arrested. And, and perhaps as he spoke these words, there's a vineyard in view. He's very interested at this point in them being clean set apart for the task that he had. And he used, I believe, two different applications in this passage. In one, he speaks to the group. And the other, he speaks to the individual. And he says, first of all, you've been cleansed as a group. They had been cleansed as a group by the words he spoke. And my guess is also by the removal of Judas. He's speaking to 11 disciples. Judas is no longer with him. Hmm. Judas is no longer with him. Judas is going to show up in a couple more chapters and betray him and then kill himself. He was the one who had the outward appearance of belief but never truly put his faith in Jesus. And as a result, he was removed from their midst. And the truth of the matter is God still is in the removing business. Sometimes he'll purge a group of people. Hear me. Sometimes he'll purge a church. Those removed by the providence of God. Why? We must understand this. As we mentioned the very first song when we started our service, God is concerned with spiritual purity. It's not about you and me living how we want and then coming and giving God his day on Sunday. He wants spiritual purity. He's concerned that in our lives we stay right with him. Hear me. Are you living life God's way? I'm not talking about, are you at church on Sunday? Because I see you. And you're to be commended. I'm glad you came this morning. Undoubtedly, you could have done many other things. Undoubtedly, uh, things uh, popped up. And, and you're here, and that's wonderful. May I ask you about tomorrow? You say, no, Pastor, you can't. You're the preacher on Sunday. That's my life on Monday. Does God have control? Are you following his way of living? Or are we doing what we want and then expecting him to bless? God is concerned with spiritual purity, with holiness. But, but, but my way, you know, what he said and, and, and what, what all that, that was so long ago. My way, you know, it's 2021, Pastor. Okay, holiness doesn't age. <laughs> Jesus is holy. And when we abide in him, we can only become more like him. 
We're going to see that in, in a few weeks as we abide in him, we'll become like him. He, he, they had been cleansed as a group, but they'd also been cleansed individually. Purging is a part of God's purification process. And he uses, watch this, his word as a cleansing agent. It's a pruning tool to mold us into his image. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is quick and powerful. Notice what it does. Mm -hmm. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard for me to even describe the difference between the soul and spirit. And God's word pierces in, even between the, the two. And of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Entering our lives with power to cleanse, to purify us. Why does it need to do that? Because purging always produces more fruit. God has a purpose for purging. He wants us to be pure, bearing fruit that pleases him. Maybe you have a great burden. Maybe you're in the midst of a great trial. If you've been running from God and his purging has brought chastisement, I beg of you this morning, turn back to him. If he's trying to touch your life and bring you closer to the vine, bend willingly to his touch. Simply say, God, I acknowledge to you today that I'm just a branch and you're the vine. Amen. That you're the husbandman. And if this trial is meant to bring me closer to you, then I accept it and I claim your grace to see me through. And then we get to our memory verse for this morning, 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried in the fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And we get to a point where the Lord gets us through and we look back and boy, that was difficult. But I see, Lord, how you brought me closer to you now. I see how I'm more like you now and and. Oh, all the money in the world couldn't buy the closeness that I have with you. Abiding with him through times of purging, we'll be able to praise and thank him one day. James 1, 4 says it this way, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Well, what's happening there? James is writing to the Christians in Jerusalem not to run during times of purging. When he wrote that book, there was much persecution. There was a lot of scattering. There's a lot of people running for the hills. There's a lot of folks turning away from Jesus. And he said, no, no, no. Let patience have her perfect work. That ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. God wants to mold you, wants to make you more mature, complete in him. We're tempted, though, to return to sinful habits. We're tempted to return to a fleshly life during times of purging. Instead of abiding faithful in God's word and keeping a sensitive heart and abiding in him, we're tempted to withdraw from God. And all we're doing as a result is limiting God's work in our hearts. Hear me this morning. God will not force his work on you. As a loving father, you still have to allow him to work. And when we run from God in a time of purging, we're re restricting the eventual fruit, the fruit bearing that he would have produced. God, God's plan for our lives is not over until we enter heaven. The mishaps, the tragedies, those are not reasons to bail out or turn from God. They're reasons to stay faithful and hopeful. As we sang earlier, all the way my, my Savior leads me. What have I to ask me time? Each year's each wandering path I tread. Going through a dark tunnel is not when we jump out. It's when we trust the engineer to get us through. So how do you deal with purging this morning? What's the cure for pruning? It's simply abiding in Jesus. This is not the most encouraging message, I know. You're not the first person to weep. I don't say that with a hard heart. We won't be the last one to weep. We're not the first one that needs God's help. But God is still on the throne. 
And your day to bloom is just around the corner. So sit still. <laughs> Remain. Abide. Because <laughs> greater fruit is just ahead. If we abide in his purging. Let's bow our heads and hearts together for prayer this morning. Thank you for listening.